maybe seated after we do that. Well, it is a brand new year, 2016. It is 2016. Well, can I tell you something? 2016 has in store for you the blessings of the Lord. Come on, somebody. A lot of times we get wrapped up in all of the challenges and the situations of 2015, and we wonder if 2016 is going to be any better. We look at our past year, and we wonder, is our new year going to be any better? And a lot of times there's discouragement, but I want to read to you this portion of Scripture before we get started today. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1, it says, The preparations of the heart belong to man. Say, that's me. Okay? Even if you're a lady here, that's me. Right? And it says, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And that answer is basically the source of wisdom. It comes from the Lord. So you have to prepare in 2016, but you get your source of wisdom from him. Okay? Verse 2. It says, all the ways, everybody say all. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, and those ways are your motives. It's not just about you going to work. It's not just about you going to church. It's not just about you going to the grocery store. It's what's your motives in 2016? What are your motives in this upcoming year? And it says all the motives or the ways of man, they're pure in his own eyes. Have you ever known somebody? It's like, you're like, what are you thinking, man? But in their own mind, they think that they're right on track and that their motives are pure. And everybody has their own thought of what they're doing. And the motives of man are pure in his own eyes. But it's the Lord who weighs their spirit. So you can think what you want, but ultimately, in the end, it's God who, who judges our motives and knows our spirit, right? He knows us better than anybody. Then in verse 3, I like this. It says, commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts, your thoughts will be established. In other words, he says, if you will make sure your heart is pure in 2016, if you will strategize your ways in 2016, if you will take your joy and put it in me in 2016, I will establish your very thoughts. But the first thing we have to do is we have to renew our mind and make sure our thoughts are his thoughts. The Bible says his ways are higher than ours. We can't fathom his thoughts. But if we will keep ourselves aligned with his ways, he will establish your thoughts. That means we got to think. A lot of us want to get through the year not thinking. I've heard so many people say, well, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. I'm just waiting on the Lord. You're not thinking. The Lord's waiting for you to have a thought. Because he can't establish your thoughts if you're not thinking. Right? So we've got to think in 2016. We've got to plan our ways in 2016. We've got to establish ourselves in Him in 2016. And everything we do needs to be in alignment with Him. And if it is, He will establish your very thoughts. Come on, somebody. You know what that means? That means you have the freedom to think. Get, get this now. Get this. This is big. You have the freedom to think. If we renew our mind, and we think the way the Lord wants us to think, he will establish your very thoughts. He will bring your thoughts into existence. So now you just have to think, right? Don't think that because 2015 was terrible that 2016 is going to be terrible. Because if you think differently, in other words, if you think that the Lord will make you new, if you think that what used to be will not be tomorrow, if you think about it, God's going to establish a new day. Renew your mind and let God establish your thoughts. In 2016, think differently. Walk differently. Praise differently. Worship differently. Give differently. Speak differently. See things differently. In 2016, you have the choice, you have the freedom to think and do it the way you know this word describes his promises. Amen? Amen. 
Come on, anybody with me this morning? I know everybody's cold and you're kind of trying to thaw out right now. I get it, I get it. And some of you are kind of like just trying to calm down right now because you might have almost hit five curves coming in. I get it, I get it. Some of you hit a sidewalk or two, I know. We were watching you out the window. We sent Steve to go help you out, you know? We're trying to help everybody out. I promise you, it's, we're just, we're new to this snow thing. It didn't snow at all last year. We don't even have salt. I go, we need a salt. Said, Do we have salt? I go, no. We got, go check the kitchen. We'll <laughs> be out there with salt shakers. <laughs> don't work, does it? That doesn't work. So we'll better prepare ourselves and make sure everybody's safe. Obviously, we have a lot of people that we're unable to be here because of the snow. Some people just don't have cars that make it. I mean, you could have a half a centimeter of snow and they can't even, you know, it's, it's tough for them, right? But I'm sure there are many people watching online, so let's give them a shout. Come on, everybody, God bless you. We know you're watching online where it's warm and cozy. And so praise God with us. We wanna bless you right where you are. We're gonna be praying for you. But we also have many, many that are sick in body today. We got phone call after phone call. As you can see, a lot of our staff aren't even here. My wife wasn't able to be here this morning. She has a terrible, terrible ear infection. Um, she went to bed halfway okay, but woke up terrible. It's all swollen on one side, so she's gonna go check that out this afternoon. Um, Pastor Randy is at home with his wife and his kid. His kid was thrown up all last night, and, and Pastor Michelle is uh, obviously um, two weeks away from having a baby. And, uh, but besides that, she was not feeling well either. And uh, she texted me and said, it's not related to the pregnancy. I think her and Matthew caught something and it's, and of course, uh, Pastor Randy can't leave a, a wife that is about to go into labor with a kid that's thrown up. So, so they're at home as well. There are several, several others that called us and said that they were sick in body. Uh, so combine that with the terrible weather and the icy roads, uh, there's a lot of people that need our prayer, amen? And we're going to need to be prayed up when we leave this place. <laughs> Make sure we can get home. Come on, somebody. God's got you. God's got you. Do you believe that? If you do, say amen. amen. All right. Well, go ahead and stand with me. Let's go into the, to the service with prayer. Let's invite the Spirit of God to be in this place. And uh, let's pray for those that are sick in body, some that weren't able to be here. Can we do that? In fact, I know that we're kind of scattered abroad, uh, but would you just move somewhere where you can grab somebody's hand? Let's agree as a church this morning, can we? Let's agree as a church this morning that God's going to touch the bodies of the sick, He's going to heal them, and that people will be safe today, all right? And let's just agree that God would come and do His thing right here in this church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how good you are to us. And right now, Lord, we lift up every person that is sick in body. God, all the ones that I know about, my wife, the Curleys, Marcy, many, many others, God, that are sick in body. God, I pray that you would touch them right where they are. Lord, that you would heal their bodies, that their bodies would come into alignment with you and the way you've created them. Every ligament, every muscle, every nerve. God, let it all come into alignment. God, I pray that they would feel comfort right now, that your healing hand would touch them, for by your stripes we have already been healed. So God, we claim that healing right now for them in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for everybody's safety that's on the road right now. Even those that are still trying to get to church, God, we pray safety over them. Keep them safe. And Lord, as we go into this worship time, God, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would just be free to move in our hearts and in our lives. God, that not one of us would be here the same, but each one changed by a moving of your spirit. God, we pray for our children in Children's Church right now. God, that you would bless their spirits, their hearts, God. Lord, bless the teachers, Lord. Anoint the tech team, the worship team, the ushers, the greeters, God. We just give everything that we have to you this morning, that you would be glorified, that you would be exalted upon high, that no other name would be lifted up but the name of Jesus this morning. And Lord, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Well, while you're standing around, why don't you hug somebody's neck, tell them you love them, and we'll worship in just a few minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
spend a few moments giving you praise, Lord. Just sing from your heart the word that comes to you.
thing I really appreciate about the Spirit of God is sometimes when you have fewer people in the building, there tends to be this opportunity to be a little more intimate, just you and him. There's less distractions. There's not as many people looking around. And you should be intimate, just you and him. And if you will just Allow yourself to be intimate with the Spirit of God. He will move in you. And He will move among you. And He will move around you. Because I'll be honest with you. You know, we got a lot of people watching from home today. And that's okay. I'll be honest with you, though. It does not... Having this room packed to the, to the gill is not as important as having the Spirit of God. Now, come on, somebody. It doesn't, we could, we could stuff them in the hallway and out the back, which we thought we were going to have to do Friday night. 
But that's not as important as making sure that the Spirit of God is right here in this place, moving in your hearts and in my heart and in their hearts. And in the, and in the presence of God, there is freedom. Come on, somebody. I'll tell you one thing about CLC. We will never, ever compromise the presence of God and His Holy Spirit over numbers. It's not going to happen. Because... I don't care if we have a 5,000 member church, if the Spirit of God's not there, then what does it matter? So that's why you can feel a presence here, because when you're, when you're just you and God, and not 150 other people looking at you, it's just you and God. Then he says, oh, now I, now I got your heart. Now I got your spirit. It's just me and you, son. It's just me and you, daughter. And when it's just you and God, oh my goodness. That's when real work can be done. Amen? Amen. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he can't move in a 5,000 member church. I was part of a 5,000 member church. and Spirit of God moved just fine there too. But what I'm here to tell you is that it doesn't have to be. It just has to be you and him. Amen? If we can get just a couple ushers here, we want to just continue our worship before we get into the Word with an opportunity to worship in our giving. Once again, I just want to thank you for your obedience in this area, especially if you're new here. You know, I've seen some new families here, and they just get right in, sowing seed. And for, for some of you who weren't here Friday, this is your first seed. The first seed of 2016, and how awesome is that? It's incredible to be able to sow a first seed. And what I talked about Friday was let that seed be a representation of what you want to harvest in 2016. Right? Sow good seed into good ground and let it represent what you desire to harvest this year. Amen? So the, the offering that you hold in your hand right now, it represents your harvest. It represents what you want to harvest. All right? It represents joy. You want to harvest joy? Then you got to sow joy. Let that offering represent your joy. You got to sow joy in the people. Right? So when you when you sense that someone is down, go sow joy into them. When you sense that someone is hurting, go sow healing into them. When you sense that somebody is lost, Go sow your spiritual GPS into them. I don't know. But let your seed today represent your harvest for tomorrow. This is the first seed for 2016 for some of us that work here Friday. Let it be a seed of faith. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are so good to us. And Lord, we thank you that the seed that we hold in our hands today will represent a harvest for tomorrow. God, we just pray that you would multiply it. God, bless both the gift and the giver. For those who have not to give today, pour out a double portion upon their life that they'd have a testimony of your grace and your mercy over them. And Lord, we just thank you that you are bigger than all of our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Worship Him in your giving. It's a high form of your worship, and we want to make sure we don't miss out on that opportunity. And after you give, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to go back a little ways to Genesis chapter 12. I want to tell you before I get into the Word and as you're worshiping, that I truly love being your pastor. I love it. I love it. Last Friday night, I read all of your comments. Many, many, many comments came in about how great Friday night was. And how, how you've been blessed by this church and by this body. And I got a confession to make. I probably read your posts Ten times. I just love reading it. 
I love reading it. I love the testimonies. I love the spirit that comes from you when you are recognizing the grace of God that's been poured over your life. So keep those testimonies coming in. I love being the pastor of this church. I love the staff that God has surrounded me with. The pastoral staff, half of them not here today, but nonetheless, and we love them. I love them. You know? I just love uh, just uh, the, the unity in this house. And I don't say that to brag. I say that because I'm, I'm just blessed. I'm blessed. When there's unity in the house, it's so much easier to pastor the church. <laughs> Listen, I've been on pastoral, I've been on a pastoral staff where there was no unity. That's the worst job in the world. I don't like being on staff at a church where there's no unity. I love being here. Because there's unity. Amen? Amen. Genesis chapter 12. Starting in verse 1. If you will stand for the reading of the word. Some of y'all are like calling me out on that nowadays. Like, if I don't have you stand, what's he doing? We can't reach him. Don't reach him. You gotta stand first. You know what? If I forget, you can just stand. All right. Is that a, is that a fair deal? If I forget, you can just stand. Of course, I don't know when I've ever forgot, but you can just stand on your own and everybody will get it. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, and it says this. The Lord had said to Abram, leave. Everybody say leave. Leave. Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family. And go. Everybody say go. go. To the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. We say bless. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan when they arrived in Canaan. And we'll get to the rest. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reading of your word. I pray that it would enrich our lives, and God, that we would be open to hear every word. Let it change us. Let it move us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. I appreciate you. Y'all know many of you have kids. Some of you have sons. Some of you have daughters. I have a son and daughters. And I hate to tell you this, but I've got the best one. She's <laughs> pretty good. She's pretty good. Today I want to start a short mini-series called Life is a Journey. We'll just short it and call it Journey. Any Journey fans in the house? That's what I thought. <laughs> Life is a journey. And every step we take is a step in our journey. When we have to get from point A to point B, everything in between we call the journey. The journey from A to B. I remember a journey that I went on long ago. I was a, an evangelist for a short time. I had a short stint as an evangelist. You know, when you're young and you're trying to find your calling in your ministry, I tried everything. I served. I was a junior high guy for a while. I took a, a youth pastor's position in Elk, Washington, and took the youth group from 13 to 120 every Wednesday. It was pretty cool. We had a great youth ministry there, and I was still seeking and searching and uh, really didn't know at that time that, that I was supposed to be senior pastoring. So I thought, well, you know, it looks pretty cool when I see evangelists, man, they take an offering every time for them. 
<laughs> they don't ever pay when they go out to eat with the crew. Let me try that. So I put in my notice at uh, the Country Church of the Open Bible in Elk, Washington. Now, just let the name sink in for a second. The Country Church of the Open Bible. No offense to all you country folk, but if you look at me, I'm not real country. Now, I can try to fake it every once in a while, but I ain't real country. So the church, uh, although it was a blessing, I was blessed there. It was a great church. I loved my pastor. He had my back. I had his. I have no regrets or complaints about that season of my life. Elk, Washington had a population of 300 people. Our church had a population of 300 people. Our youth group grew to 120. It was an amazing season of my life. I went into a small mom and pop restaurant right there on the highway about a mile from my church. That's where I ate lunch every single day. And to my surprise, I look on the countertop where you pay your bill and there was a ballot box. For the mayor of and I looked at the ballot ready to vote for my next mayor, and to my surprise, I see like seven names, and mine was one of them. <laughs> this was a very short stint of my political career. I didn't know I had a political career. I didn't even know I was running for mayor. Somebody had put my name in, thought I'd be a good candidate. Found out later that it was a joke from one of my youth staff. That quickly turned into not so funny. Because I was like second place. <laughs> By a very small margin, I was thinking, I, I don't know nothing about mayoring. <laughs> Luckily, Drew, I lost. So I was not the mayor of Elk, Washington. But I didn't know if I was supposed to continue being a youth pastor or if I was supposed to be in politics or, but I thought, you know, let's try this evangelistic thing. So I packed up my small four by four pickup truck. No joke. Anybody ever watch the Beverly Hillbillies on TV? <laughs> that is what my truck looked like. No joke. I went high, high, okay? I roped that thing and I packed everything I owned into my truck and I hit the road. I started in Seattle area, the Seattle area, the Eastern Washington area. Uh, I started in uh, the Tacoma area, preached in a church there and made myself, made my way all the way across the country through, I think it was Tennessee, uh, into uh, uh, Iowa, and then on down into Florida. Is that right, Mom? Tennessee. Tennessee, I went to Iowa also, because I saw uh, my Uncle Randy, um, and then went into Florida. I don't know how south we went in. I think, um, uh, what, what town was that in Florida? Anyway, Florida's a long way away. That's a long trek by myself in a truck. It was a journey. But that's just the start of it. Just to see a single young guy like me in a truck stacked that high, I mean, I had to watch the bridges. <laughs> make sure I didn't hit a bridge. And, uh, you know, I, mean, I just went thousands of miles just preaching. I didn't have any whoop, whoop. I couldn't lock my truck up. I just had to trust God that every church I went to, they wouldn't steal my truck stuff, you know? <laughs> And uh, it really wasn't, I don't even know what I owned at that time. I didn't, you know, what do I have that would stack that high? But it was, it was a lot of stuff. But anyway, to top that off, it was right around the fall season and heading into winter. And the truck had no heater. So I traveled across all the way to Florida, which wasn't so bad. It wasn't on my way there. It was on my way back across the country that... It got really cold. Went through New Mexico and all these really, really cold areas in the wintertime with no heater. So what I did is I bought a little space heater. I bought a little converter, and right in the middle of my cab, I put a space heater in my truck. 
Now, I've heard since then that that's not the wisest thing to do. But it's a journey. Sometimes in our journey, we don't always make the wisest decisions. Come on, somebody. Sometimes in our journey, we don't always make right choices. In the moment, we think it's right or we wouldn't have done it. But in the end, years later, we look back and go, how dumb were you? And I can honestly say, pretty dumb. Pretty dumb. You're not supposed to put space heaters inside a vehicle, right? But that's the only way I could keep warm. It didn't always work. It would always uh, fog up on my windshield, and I, I would have to scrape the inside of my windshield as I was traveling just so I could see through. How many of you have ever been on a journey like that? You had to scrape your window on the inside to see through. It's a journey. Sometimes we're walking through this life journey, looking through the windshield in front of us with a scrape that big. And you can't see the side of you. You can't see behind you. You can't see above or below. All you can see is right in front. And the problem is, is that the enemy is trying to come in from the side. He doesn't want to come at you where you can see him. He wants to try to sideswipe you. And so you gotta have that windshield clear. See, my son is driving our truck right now because his, his Mercedes doesn't have any heat, so he can't defrost the window. And I tried driving it, uh, I think, last week to church. That was a journey in itself. <laughs> you, can't, you can't stay warm, you can't defrost. It was terrible. And I drove across the country like that. It was a journey. And I want to tell you that if we go into 2016 as a church, we're all in this journey together. We're in a journey. Your salvation, your, your, your uh, plan to make it to heaven is going to require a journey from here to there. Everywhere in between is a journey. When you get out on the road, like I went on the road to, to do some Christmas shopping before Christmas, and just getting from West Salem to downtown was a journey. And it was a scary journey because there's people coming from every direction, and the, the streets get crowded, and not everybody drives as good as me. <laughs> so I'm not worried about my driving. I'm worried about other people's driving, right? Because they can sideswipe you, and they don't even know it. So you gotta watch out for other people. But you can't watch out for other people if you're only scraping your window this much. Yeah. See, in 2016, you gotta broaden your vision. You have got to broaden what you see. If you get tunnel vision, then you're not gonna be able to defend yourself from the enemy who's trying to come in from the side and from the back. You've got to have that vision, that vision all the way around. And if you find yourself in a cycle, repeating, 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 it might be because you have not brought in your vision to see what God wants to do to defend you on this side, and on this side, and behind you, and above you, and below you. You're so focused on what you saw in 2015, you can't see what God has for you in 2016. Right? I've preached this many times. If you let too many people talk in your ear, you lose sight of what God has before you. If there's too much noise, you lose vision. I don't know how that is. I'm not a doctor here. I don't know if your hearing is directly con connected to your sight. All I know is that when my dad couldn't find the roads, he had to turn the stereo down. He couldn't see the signs if the stereo was too loud. He had to turn it down. Some of y'all yelled at your kids. Turn that music down. I gotta concentrate. I gotta see the roads. Right? When I'm trying to watch a Seahawks game, kids are being too loud. I can't see the TV as well. I gotta send them packing. Go play in the other room. Right? Go play in the other room. I was watching the Ducks game last night. Lord, help us all. Lord, help us all. I, I, you know, it's probably a good thing that not everybody's here today because I'd have half y'all cheering for, the, for, for someone else and then I'd have to have an altar call and all that stuff. But <laughs> you gotta, you got to be able to focus and you can't focus when there's too much going on. This is a life journey. So here's Abram. Here's, Abram was going on a journey, but he was smarter than me. I didn't, he didn't go in a 4x4 pickup all by himself. I went all by myself. 
He took some people away. He took his wife. He took his nephew. All the people that he housed, he took with him. See, I could start a church all on my own if, if I just took everybody that's ever lived in my house and took them with me to start a church. We'd have a great, great big church. Probably bigger than this right now. So he took everybody with him. It was a journey. See, you can't go through a journey alone. You will kill yourself if you try to go through this journey alone. So my stint as an evangelist only lasted three months because I, I just couldn't keep doing it. I didn't like being in a truck by myself on the open roads. My best, I mean, the best part of my travels was when I was in New Mexico, coming across, back across, going west, and I looked on the hillside, and there were a bunch of bighorn sheep right there on the side of the road. That was the highlight of my trip. <laughs> because when there wasn't big sheep, and there wasn't beautiful hills, there was just a lot of barren road in the desert. And you know, it, it's no fun driving a pickup truck with no heat and you're alone on an open highway for nine hours straight. That's no fun. When you go in this journey of life, you want to take people with you. You want to go with somebody, with somebody that understands the journey, with somebody that can raise your arms up when you're tired, with somebody that can take the wheel when you've got to sleep. You've got to go through this journey with somebody. And here's the problem. In 2015, there's been too many of us journeying alone. Journeying alone. Now, I'm not talking about you don't have a wife or a husband or kids or you're not going to church. That's not what I'm talking about. Some of y'all are, are going through stuff and you're not letting anybody in your stuff to take the wheel with you. See, on my journey as an evangelist, I didn't have anybody to take the wheel. And at that time, I'll tell you right now, that song wasn't written, Jesus, take the wheel. I don't, I, don't let me, I can't sing that. I don't even know what's her name. I can't even remember her name. Carrie Underwood, right? She. I don't even know if she was born yet, to be honest. So, so that song wasn't even there. I couldn't even sing, Jesus, take the wheel. I was by myself. And sometimes in life, we're going through this journey. And in 2016, if I could just start the year telling you this, don't go into 2016 without anybody to take the wheel when you need somebody to take the wheel. Don't go into 2016 and you have nobody to raise your arms up when you're tired. You've got to go through this journey with somebody. Abram took his wife. He took his nephew. And then he said, hey, all y'all that live with me and still got stuff in my garage, you're going with me. Why? Because he needed some people. He needed people. We all need people. Folks, can I just tell you this? We can't do this ministry without you because we can't do it alone. We need each other. We need each other. And one of the favorite things about ministry for me is doing this with family. And here's the cool thing is that y'all become my family. The moment you start showing up more than once or twice, the moment you start putting an offering in the plate, the moment you start showing up for functions, guess what? There's no paper to sign. There's no membership form. You're just family. And if you're family then we're all going on this journey together. Amen. It's one of the things I love about my brother-in-law. He always reminds me, listen, this is what is, is super important. We're doing ministry and life together. You can't do ministry and not life together. You can't do life and not ministry together. We have to do ministry and life together. So that's why, even as tired as we are, we'll go out to dinner with people, we'll go out to lunch with people, we'll spend our Thanksgivings together, we'll spend our Christmases together because we're on a journey together and we're life and ministry together. So I want to go bowling with y'all. I want to go golfing with y'all. 
I want to go do the things you like to do. I want to go watch a game with you. I want to go to lunch. I want to go to dinner with you. Now, obviously, I can't go to dinner with all of y'all at the same time unless we go find a really big restaurant. Okay? Like we did at IHOP, right? When 50 family showed up together to do life and ministry. Think about it. That's you're talking about a memory that you'll never you'll never lose. Because you'll remember the Christmas of 2015 when we packed that IHOP out. And the lady that was serving us nearly to tears. And two other servers that helped her nearly to tears. And Pastor Kevin came in a, a onesie dressed like Batman. You'll never forget that. That's one of the reasons why I do stuff like that. So that it'll be imprinted in your mind. Pastor Kevin came in a onesie. A Batman one. Actually, onesie sounds really awful. <laughs> Pastor Kevin came in this cool Batman suit. Right? We're doing life and ministry together. This is why when Bob showed up and got crafted into this house, he can come in and start teaching his Bible study on Tuesday, and he's not alone. I'm going to be here his first few times because I want to make sure he's got everything he needs, that he's got his microphone ready, and he's got his chairs ready, his tables. He had to keep kicking me out. He's like, Pastor Kevin, we've got guys that will set up these tables. And I'm like, i got to just make sure you're taken care of. Why? Because he's not doing ministry over here, and I'm doing ministry over here. We're doing life and ministry now together. Amen. Together. So that means when he's in need, he knows he can count on me. And I know that when I'm in need, I can count on him. This is a journey together. So when you have a concern, that becomes my concern. And when you have a celebration, that becomes my celebration. Amen. It's a journey together. We have to be in this journey together. Abram took some people with him because it's a journey that he needed to, to have some support and some strength, right? And, and, and here's the cool thing is that when you're with your tribe, and I like to call it a tribe. We can call it family or whatever. But when you're with your family or when, when you're with your tribe, then even the bad stuff ain't so bad. Right. Did you realize that? The bad stuff ain't so bad when you're with your tribe. The bad stuff will kill you when you feel like you're alone. It will. The stuff you can't stand, the stuff that gets you down, it will destroy you when you feel like you're alone. This is why when, when, uh, when your children go through pain, they're going to come wrap their arms around your leg because they feel better when they know mom and dad are with them. It's funny because my kids, they, especially my youngest daughter, she's, she was almost like a, 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 an only child because there were six years between her and her older sister. So she's, a, she's our baby. You know, she's our baby, and you know, even though she's in double digits now, she was our baby. But sometimes she'd get a little scratch, and I mean, you'd think that we had to go to the ER for a, for a splinter. And she'd be screaming her head off, but all we have to do is say, oh, come here, come here, come here. And then I would tell her a joke, or I would say something funny about her splinter. She would laugh and go, oh, wait, you can't laugh and cry at the same time, <laughs> right? They're either tears of sorrow or they're tears of joy. Which one is it? You pick. Dad, stop. <laughs> right? Because we want to cry sorrow. We want to cry in pain. We want to be in disgust. We want to be hurting. We, when, we just, when we realize we don't have to, it almost makes us mad. Because I try to get my daughter to laugh some more, she starts yelling, stop it, Dad, stop it. But I got you to smile already, so now the gig is up. Right? So every time we come together in life and ministry and we see this journey that we're on and we can smile because the Holy Spirit has blessed us, the gig's up for you, which means you can't continue in that sorrow. You can try, but you don't have to. That's the cool thing is you just don't have to. Because God is with you. It's a journey, church. It's a journey. The, you know, the, the miracles that we want to see every day, the, the, the power of God we want to see every day, yeah, we can see it every day, but this, 
thing called life, this, this thing called salvation, this relationship with the Father, getting is really, you know, from us getting to point from point A to point heaven, it's a journey. And every day is going to have its own challenges. Every day is going to have its own victories. So it's a journey. And we should enjoy the journey. Now let's let's look at this uh, this scripture right here. Well, the very first one uh, in our text, verse one: The Lord had said to Abram, "Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family." Which I never really could completely understood that. I'm going to have to ask Bob later because he talks about your relatives, but then it also talks about your father's family, which I thought was also your relatives. But anyway, uh, maybe he's talking about. You know, your direct family and then your extended family. I don't know. But anyway, he says, leave your native country, leave your relatives, and leave your father's family. Leave it. Now, this is interesting because when you really, 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 really want to connect with God, you have to leave what you're comfortable with. And I like to say it this way. You can't get where you want to be unless you leave where you are. See, if I want to go out that door, it is impossible unless I leave this place right here. And so sometimes we know we want to be over there, but it's too uncomfortable to leave where we are, so we just leave it. We just forget it. And here's the problem with that decision, is that all the promises of God are right before you, but you have to leave where you're comfortable in order to go get it. There have been times where my kids wanted to go blackberry picking. And I was like, you know, I like blackberries, but I, I, I'm, I'm really, really afraid of blackberry bushes. I tell my kids all the time, don't mess around with blackberry bushes, because you will die. <laughs> you will die. We have gone fishing in some areas where I was literally physically attacked by a blackberry bush. <laughs> trying to walk along the bank, and this vine was down below. I didn't see it. And that vine literally grabbed me. And the more I tried to escape, the more it wrapped around my, and it was scratching into my, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> so we don't mess around with blackberry bushes, because if you fall into one, you'll probably bleed to death. <laughs> yeah, you think I'm kidding, but I, I'm serious. Don't, don't mess with that. <laughs> It'll be a journey you don't want to take. All right? So when you look at the fruit of the blackberry, and you know how good it is, but then you see the danger of a blackberry bush and how it can kill you, me, myself, I'm like, nah, that's all right. That's all right. I'll just go to Safeway. I'll go buy some blackberries at Safeway. Right? Because I don't want to take that journey. It's too painful. And see, I'm comfortable right here on, on the, the sandy beach where I'm fishing on the riverside and, and where the water's running over my toes. And I'm comfortable right here. Don't, don't take me over there where the blackberry bushes can attack me. And here's the thing is God's blessings are before you, but you see the, the, the enemy has attacked you here or attacked you there, and you see the stuff that you're comfortable with. See, I'm comfortable right here in my home. I'm comfortable right here in my sofa. I'm comfortable right here in my recliner. There's a reason why they call it a lazy boy. <laughs> right? No offense to lazy boy reps. Do we have any lazy boy reps in the house? <laughs> are you serious? You are not. <laughs> Wow. I never thought that would happen. I mean, half our church ain't even here today. I apologize. But Abram was instructed to leave his native country. And can I tell you this? Just because you were born somewhere and it's native to you doesn't mean you're supposed to stay there. See, you got to let go of your pride sometimes and understand that God might have a new location for you or a new camp for you or a new season for you. And sometimes you're going to have to leave everything you know, everything you're familiar with, everything that you've been, you grew up in. You might have to, what? Leave. And then he says, go. Are we willing in 2016 to leave everything we're comfortable with? It was 
not that long ago, just about four years ago, maybe five years ago, Pastor Randy and Michelle had to leave their native country. And I do call it a country because it's kind of weird over there. And that's their own land in eastern Washington. Right? They, they say that once you go there, you'll never leave there. And you wonder why that is, because there's no trees. It, it's just, I, I was there for almost 10 years. I don't know how. I just moved there, and I woke up 10 years later, and I was still there. But Pastor Randy and Michelle had to leave their native land. They grew up there. They went to high school there. They know everything about it, and they had to leave everything they were comfortable with to come here to the big city. <laughs> Say no more. They had to leave everything they were comfortable. Let me tell you something. It was a hard move. See, they had been thinking about moving to, to join up with Pastor Kevin and Christy for years before that. And every year was something else. Every year is like, I'm not sure. And every year was family and dealing with family. And, but all my family is here. And all my, you know, and the Bible says, leave your country and your family. Now listen. I'm not telling y'all to leave next week. I'm just telling you, when, when you're thinking about your journey, don't let everything you're comfortable with keep you from moving forward with God. Sometimes you have to leave the very thing you're comfortable with in order to get where God wants you to be. And where God wants you to be may be a little uncomfortable. It may be a little uncomfortable, but he says, leave, and then he says, Go. It says leave and then go. Life is a journey. And unless, listen, here's the thing, is there is no journey if you're not going. What kind of journey did you go on last year? Well, I went from West Salem. I went to the Lancaster Mall. There really is no journey. We all are agreeing, and I, I kind of set y'all up because I got y'all pumped up at the beginning of the message, and we're all like, yes, it's a journey. Yes, it's a journey. But it's not a journey if you're not going somewhere. There is no instant poof from here to heaven. It's not instant poof. It's a life journey with God. It's a daily walk with God. So where are we going? Because if you're not going anywhere, there is no journey. So now you're all excited about the journey, and yet you haven't taken a step yet. What step are you taking in 2016? What step are you making in 2016? Where are you going in 2016? Because all of us need to have a vision, because the Bible says that without a vision, the people will perish. And I don't want to die. I want to live. I live for God. There's so much more I want to do for Him. There's so much more I want to do for the Lord. So I've got to have a vision. I've got to have a purpose. I have to have a journey. I don't like staying stagnant because, you know, stagnant things stink it. <coughs> they stink it. I can tell you, I just walk into my kids' rooms. <laughs> and there's things in my kids' rooms that have been stagnant for a while. And they speak it. You know why? Because it, it's not moving. It's not growing. And the, and the true definition of, of dead is anything that ceases to change or grow. So if you cease to change, if you cease to grow, then by definition, guess what? You're dead. And there's no journey you can go on if you're already dead. So you've got to be alive. And you got to seek the change. And you got to step forward. And if you want something you've never had before, you have to do something you've never done before. So what are you going to do differently in 2016? It's a journey. And we all need to go on the journey together. See, I refuse. I refuse to grow old having never left where I am. I refuse to, to grow old having never left. Now, I, no offense to those of you who were born and raised in Salem, and, and you're probably going to die in Salem, and, and no offense to you who are proud of it. But every once in a while, I'll take a journey. Every once in a while, I'll go past the borders of Salem-Kaiser. 
Go past the borders of Albany and Eugene and, and, and Springfield. Okay? Every once in a while, go beyond the coast. You might have to put a wetsuit on and grab a surfboard, but go past the sand. Be on a journey. That's the one thing about this church is we like to journey. Now, sometimes we journey a little too far, too quick, and we've got to turn around and go back home away before we die. Like, we didn't pack enough supplies. <laughs> and if you go on a journey too long without the proper supplies, you can hurt yourself. So you got to plan. you got to strategize. you got to seek the Lord. But go on a journey. Go on a journey. So he was instructed to go. Psalm 37, 23 says it like this. Psalm 37, 23 says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly, and he delights in every detail of their lives. I want to delight myself in him, and I want him to delight himself in me. Because if that happens, then he will direct every step. But can I tell you something? He cannot direct steps that you're not taking. Take a step. If you don't take a step, then he can't guide those steps. If you don't walk forward, he can't move with you. If you don't walk up, uh, that direction, he can't lead you that direction. If you're just standing still, there's no leading of the Holy Spirit. See, when I go to walk my dog, I hate it when he decides he doesn't want to be walked and he doesn't want to go by. And he just plants his feet right there. And like, dog, you know I'm strong enough to just drag you. And I will. But God's not going to drag any of us. Right? So I gave my dog and he eventually follows. But God is just saying, will you just come? Will you just obey? Will you let me lead you? Will you walk? Will you take a step? Will you journey with me? Because if you will, we've got so much greater things in store. Let's journey together. And let's go together. Let's let God direct our steps. Let's let him guide our path. We have to go. The funny thing is, is that sometimes we won't go because we don't know where we're going. So instead of going, we just sit until we know. And that's where we get stuck. And we're like, well, I was waiting on the Lord. I was waiting on the Lord. I was waiting on the Lord. Yeah, I, I, I wait on the Lord too, and I want to listen to God too. But sometimes He's already spoken. You just haven't recognized His voice. You haven't recognized that He was speaking to you, right? You want to know where you're going before you go. Now I know. I see. I would totally understand. I would totally understand if I was asking you to go somewhere. Say, hey, Jesse, meet me at the church, hop in my car, we're taking off. Tell your wife, your lovely, lovely lady, tell her that we will be back in three days. <laughs> He's like, I got my bag, right? I'll meet you at the church. <laughs> but I would understand if Jesse said, hey, well, where are we going? And if I said, Jesse, just get in the car. He said, oh, Pastor, I love you, man. But where are we going? What are we doing? See, I would totally understand that. I would totally understand that. Because we don't want to go unless we know. See? My dad used to say, up in the car, we just go. And then he would do this thing where he would, see, back in the day when I was younger, you know, if you ate out anywhere, that was a luxury. Right? And so my dad would just drive us, like, after church on our way home, he would just drive us, and then he would pull into a fast food joint like Burger King. Or, and back in the day, that was really exciting because they had the Burger King guy and, the, and the, 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 the Burger King Whopper that you could go climb into. and You know what I mean? It was all that stuff. We used to, and he would drive into Burger King. We're like, oh, we're going to Burger King. We're going to Burger And he would go almost to the park, and then he would drive around and then leave. Oh. <laughs> And then he would laugh. I was like, Dad, where are we going? Where are we going? Because you just stick around for the ride. 
go a couple more blocks, you see McDonald's. And that was back when they had the 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 characters that you go like this on. Like, yes, go to McDonald's! Go to McDonald's! He'd pull in, and then we'd be like, yeah, we're going! And then he'd pull out. So then, to a certain point, we're like, Dad, I'm not going. No, where are we going, Dad? I want to know, where are we going? Like, just hang on. See, sometimes we don't want to go unless we know, but God is saying, listen, I want you to leave, and then I want you to go. Now, catch this. Catch this. Now, Abraham is looking at God like, where are we going? And then he says this. Where are we? In Jeremiah 29.11. Jeremiah 29.11, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good. Somebody say good. good. Not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. Can I tell you that God has a plan for you? And his plans are good. You can trust him because his plans are good. He has a future for you. You can trust him because he has a future for you. He has a hope for you because he has a hope for you. He has a future for you. He has a plan for you. But we get so prideful in ourselves that we think we have to set the plan. We have to know the hope. We have to know the future. We need to go if we know. And other than that, we're staying right here. And we're trying to make things happen. For years, I got in trouble because I was always trying to make things happen myself. If I didn't have enough money, I would go make more money. Instead of, instead of just trusting God in all things, which is go get a third or fourth or fifth job. And if there were nobody hiring, I'd just go start a company. Mm. Mom says, that's true. I would, I would just always want to make it happen myself instead of just trusting in God, knowing he's got my back. Now, there's nothing wrong with being proactive and taking some initiative and planning your steps and being active so that God can bless that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But every once in a while, there is a problem because we're not trusting him enough. We're just trusting ourselves. And when you trust yourself more than you trust God, that's when you wreck. So we've got to trust him and not just trust ourselves. Now, let me read this to you. In verse 1, in the, at, the, at the end of verse 1, it says... Leave your native uh, country, your relatives, your father's family. Go to the land that I will what? Show you. It's interesting that God didn't say, I want you to go to the next city. I want you to go to this plot of land. He says, I want you to go and I will show you where to go. But he says, go first. First he says, leave. Then he says, go. Then he says, I will show you. In that order. Can I tell you, sometimes you just got to trust him. He's not always going to reveal to you right away. He's not always going to. But I will promise you this, that every time I've ever been obedient to God, that the final destination blew my mind. It blew my mind. And if we trust him and go, even before he shows us where we're going, he's going to blow your mind. You gotta trust him because he said, I will, I will, I will. Verse two, I will make you into a great nation. Didn't say you are a great nation. He said, I will make you into a great nation. Uh, come on, somebody. I'm almost done. He says, I will bless you. Didn't say go because you're blessed. He says, go because I will bless you. Will is a future tense verb. It doesn't mean you are blessed. It means you will be blessed, but you got to go, right? I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you famous. See, this was the first indication of a giant selfie stick for Abram. Since if you leave your native country, and if you leave your family and your father's family, I will make you famous. That was before selfie sticks, before Facebook, before anything. He says, I will make you famous. And I'm here to tell you that in 2016, if you will leave and go and obey, he's going to bless you. Listen, 
Stop thinking that you're supposed to already be blessed. Stop thinking that, you, I mean, because we are. He died on the cross for us, right? That's the ultimate already existing. But don't think that every all the fruit is supposed to already be there. He says if you will leave what you're comfortable with, go as I show you to go, I will. I will. Establish your steps. I will make you blessed, and I will make you famous. People are all going to know you. They're all going to know you. The next time Bob goes to Starbucks for his coffee, if he ever goes to Starbucks, I don't know. No? Okay. No? Wherever you go, Bob, they're going to go, Bob, aren't you that revelation teacher guy? Right? Now, I'm not saying this because I want us to all be famous and proud of that. What I'm saying is, is when you follow him, people are going to notice. You'll be famous because you followed him. Think about Billy Graham and how he followed the Lord and how the Lord made him famous, right? He didn't just, he wasn't just born famous. He had to take steps. He had to go when he didn't know where he was going. And the Lord made him famous. But I tell you something, it's a journey, church. It is a journey. And I want the worship team to come up because we're going to close with a time of remembering the Lord. This is a game changer. The journey is forever more until we reach heaven. And every day is like a journey. And every day is a journey. Here in verse 3, let me, let me share with you this. Right? He says, I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. And then verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. And curse those who treat you with contempt. And I like this. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Church, in 2016, you are going to become a world changer. Because as people see you following him, they're going to want to know you. You're going to be a world changer. But the blessings can't come to you until they can flow through you. The moment you allow God's blessings to flow through you, the blessings begin to come to you. This is a game changer. How can God allow his blessings to flow through you in 2016? Let me tell you. Just whenever you're anywhere on this journey, you find opportunity to bless others. He says, you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing. And for me, I'm the kind of guy that doesn't even like to wait. So I'm not waiting until God makes me a blessing. I'm just going to find opportunities to go be a blessing. And say, God, was that it? Nope, but keep trying. Okay, let me go bless this person. God, was that it? Nope, but that's a good one too. And the more I allow the blessings to flow through me, the more the blessings will come to me. That's what 2016 is going to be all about. That's what 2016 is going to be all about. A journey of touching lives and changing people. Touching heaven, changing earth. Come on, somebody. We want to touch heaven. This is the first Sunday of the month that we always like to, as a family, remember what Christ did for us. Because without him, this journey would be tougher than we know. So I want us as a family to remember Christ. And so today, if we can have the ushers bring the elements, I'm wondering if you would join me in remembering Christ. And you guys, I want you to stand right here today. Right up here. Bob, you'll stand right here. I'll take one. In the tray, if you're new to CLC, we have double stacked cups. The bottom cup has the bread. The top cup has the juice. Now I'm going to ask that as the worship team begins to play, as we close this service out, can we truly, I think, I think there's, enough room for those that are in the building right now. 
Can we come forward in our worship? Grab the elements and then just kind of slip to the side until everybody can fit in. Let's worship. Let's remember Christ. And let's step forward in 2016 as the Lord directs us. Can we do that? Come on, let's do that. And then we'll lead you into communion together.
In the form of this bread, as you do, remember all that he did for you. In Jesus' name. Let's all partake together. Thank you, Lord. And likewise, he took the cup and so this is my blood that was shed. Folks, if I have a hangnail that starts bleeding, I get all wigged out. But the blood that was shed on the cross, we, we wouldn't want anybody, any of our kids to even watch a movie that would shed that much blood. But he was unrecognizable. And that blood wasn't just a price to be paid. It was literally a cleansing for us. Because by his blood, we were made white as snow. All of our sins were cast away, never to be remembered again. Our sins have been forgotten. And we need to remember when we take the blood of Christ that it is washed away. It is white as snow. And every time we go back to our own junk, it's like we didn't remember the blood that was shed. Every time we go through a cycle of pain, it's like we don't remember the blood that was shed that wiped that away. Every time we go back to our old sinful nature, it was like the blood was never there. But can I tell you, the blood was there. The blood was shed. And today, as a family, on this first Sunday of 2016, let's remember the blood that was shed, can we? Father, bless this time together as we remember your blood that was shed. God, thank you for cleansing us and making us white as snow. Thank you for your consecration. Thank you, Lord, that you have set us apart. God, I thank you, Lord, that you shed your blood at Calvary for each and every one of us. And Father, as we remember you and your blood that was shed, let it be strength to us in this upcoming year. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes your journeys surprise you with things you don't like. You don't like having to change your tire in the snow. You don't like having to jumpstart your car and it's raining outside. But sometimes that's what your journey calls for and that's what happens. So don't get thrown off. Because when that happened to us, I didn't pull to the side of the road. Oh, kids, get comfortable because we're going to be here a few years. Nope. 
I had to put my big boy pants on. I had to be the husband. I had to be the father. I had to get out in the cold, and I had to take a look at that tire, and I had to fix it. Sometimes in your journey to heaven, there's going to be bumps in the road that you don't like, that you're not comfortable with, but put your big boy pants on because it gets cold outside sometimes. And get out there and continue your journey. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Look at your neighbor and say, don't stop. Tell them it's a journey. Amen? So I pray for your strength in 2016. I'm praying for your strength in 2016. That you will continue the journey boldly and with excitement. Like I want you to just go out there in the snowy, icy road, and when you pull up next to somebody who's barely moving, roll your window down and just yell at them. It's a journey! Yeah. <laughs> It's a journey. When you go to work, because a lot of y'all are going back to work tomorrow. Some of the kids are going back to school this week. And when you go back and you're talking to, to your bosses that aren't so nice and teachers that aren't so fair, you look at them and you smile and you go, it's a journey. <laughs> and you go with excitement knowing that God took it on the cross all of it. And now you're white as snow. Amen? Amen. Next week, I want to invite you back. Everybody will be used to the cold and the snow, so they'll come back to church. <laughs> We're praying healing on everybody that's sick, so they'll be back to church. So I would suggest that you get here early, even, you know, especially if it's still snowing, you got to get here early so you get a good parking spot, a good seat. I promise you if it's snowing, we'll have real salt on the sidewalks, okay? We'll get that taken care of next week, all right? But I would encourage you to come back because we're still on this journey. I've got more of this story to tell you, okay? We're also gonna have a special guest that I just found out yesterday. Pastor Roy and Dee Roberts will be in service with us next Sunday. For some of y'all who don't know who Pastor Roy or Dee Roberts is, they are uh, the pastors that I served under for almost 10 years. Spiritual fathers, spiritual mentors to me and my wife. And uh, they're going to be at a conference in Albany Thursday, Friday, Saturday, staying through the weekend to be in service with us. So come next Sunday so that you can meet some of our spiritual fathers and mothers. Okay? Amen. Amen. I want you to go with God and go with grace and let God touch you this week. All right? Heavenly Father, we just want to pray a blessing over each and every one. Seal the deal. Keep everybody safe. Those that are sick in body, God, we just pray again a covering of healing over them. Touch them with your healing hand in Jesus' name. God, we just pray that when we go out into this world in 2016, God, that we would take every step ordered of you. God, let us delight in you so that you can delight in us and then lead us and guide us every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name. Well, God bless you, church. Hug somebody's neck. Love on somebody before you go. Stay safe out there. And remember, there's no youth and no epic tonight. All right? God bless you.